Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ransomed Heart podcast. I'm Stacey Eldridge, and I get to be your host today. We're doing a series for women, but it's not just for women. You men listen in, too. Really good stuff. Joining me today are Lori McConnell and Lisa Beck. Thanks for coming, gals. Our pleasure. Good to be here. It is good. It is good. Okay, so a while back, I posted on my Facebook page a question to women asking them, you know, we're going to be doing some podcasts for women. And what is it that you would like us to talk about? What are some issues that you're in facing, wrestling with? And one that came back many times was surrounding children growing up and leaving the home, the empty nest stage. And we three are in that in different areas. And so just going to go there together. And um, so Jesus, come into this. And so if, if, yeah, if, please, if you're in that stage or you're looking towards it or you're way past it or you don't even have children, but you have friends that do, there are things to be learned, things to invite Jesus into and so much that we share in that. So, Lori, how many children do you have? I have two daughters that are both married and have families. Okay. And Lisa, really, how many children okay. do you have? I have three children. I have my oldest, Bree, married, lives in California with her husband, and Maddie, who passed about 11 years ago. Then I have Chris, who's 21 really soon and is in college in Texas. In Texas. Okay, mm-hmm. I just can't skip over Maddie, though. Just how old was she? When Maddie she... was almost um, nine years old, just a few weeks before her ninth birthday. She had several special needs, chromosome deletion situation, and she lived to just right before her ninth birthday. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you know a child leaving yes. in ways that yes. that we don't. Mm-hmm. So keep coming, mm-hmm. keep coming, Lord. And how how was it for when the first one moved out? They're both daughters, your oldest daughters. Mm-hmm. Bree went to college. She did. She in, went in Kentucky? To Kentucky, Asbury University, and is quite far from us in Colorado. And at the time, I was going through chemo. Oh, goodness. So it was a double whammy, but also really important for me, for her to go, mm-hmm. to continue her plan for her life not to stop, even though I did not believe my life was going to stop. It was definitely on pause. Mm-hmm. And so the joy of seeing her launch and to do well was really mm-hmm. rewarding. It mm-hmm. was really gratifying to see life continue. And to be real honest, I was in a chemo fog that I didn't feel the hit of missing her. It was more the joy of her calling back and telling stories of life and friendship. And so that worked for me differently. Yeah, that's like a lifeline. Mm-hmm. Like it was. It really was. That's good. And uh, Lori, how old was Lindsay when she moved out? Or did she ever move out? Is she still at home? <laughs> she was still at home. She was away for a year overseas, and and that was really hard. But it was really, she was at home and was getting ready to get married. And we moved to Colorado. She stayed in California with her new husband, John, and our youngest daughter, Megan, actually left at the same time. She went overseas and was in school for a year over there as well. And so our nest just really not fell apart, but it emptied very quick. Yes. Um, We left the nest, too. Right, right. And tell us about when Lindsay left, when she went away for a year to study abroad. When she went away, she went away for a year. She was in England going to school. And I remember just the prepping of her getting ready for this, you know, amazing life-changing year of her life. And I think I started just grieving that probably six months or so before that Mm -hmm. and realizing my daughter wasn't going to be at home and 
just the thought of missing her and grieving and going into her room and sitting on her bed mm-hmm. and and just weeping and I knew that she was she's still our daughter and going to be back but it was just just so aware of what a major transition it was going to be and that when this little girl came home she would be a grown woman and not just be so many changes in her life she would be different and so just aware of that and so you know I was prepared on some level just my heart knew what was coming yeah and I had a date and so it was you know it was rough and the interesting thing is that Craig was just as happy as could be and having the greatest time. Of course. <laughs> and the day we took her to the airport and put her on the plane and we came home and he walked into her bedroom and just completely fell apart and sobbed on her bed. And, Aww. you know, it just the the grief and just the, the walking through that journey is was different for both of us. And I actually had I hadn't moved on, but I had, you know, grieving and. So I came home, and I'm like, okay, what's next? And he was a mess. And so just the transition of learning how to even live in that. Yeah, and to live in it together, that's that's really good. And then what about when the last one left, Lisa, Mm -hmm. when Chris left? When Chris left, and Chris is very verbal and has a lot of things to say every day about his life and his friendships and his... There was a lot of activity in our house Mm -hmm. because of Chris, and it suddenly became very quiet, and our dog had died a few months before, and so it it really (laughs) did. I know. It's like bad timing. timing. Not that there's ever a good time for a dog to die, but he left a big void, and so Brad Mm. and I were kind of left staring at each other, or worse, uh, kind of going our separate ways, not not in total dysfunction or in disgust towards each other, but more in we both had things that we liked to do and had not involved crossing over into something we both did together. So he kind of ventured off into football coaching, and Mm -hmm. I ventured off into sewing and painting and hanging out with the girls. And it took a while for us to realize that we were going down separate paths. Right. That is such a common theme. I mean, it's kind of amazing how much energy and focus our children have. And we don't even know it as much as when they leave. And then many couples are left staring at each other over the kitchen table going, now, what do we talk about? Mm -hmm. Who were we before all of this adventure began? And and there's choices to be made Mm -hmm. that you're making Mm -hmm. to not create separate lives, but to find a way to have your life together still, not completely, but to intersect. So important. But I want to go back, just talk a little bit about the void. The picture is an empty nest, which I just hate. Yes. But it's actually Mm -hmm. true. And we're women in a woman's heart, in a mother's heart. You're always a mother and they are always your children. Right. But what else did you feel? Like, there's the emptiness of the space. Was there other emptiness? Well, there's a lack of actual activity because you don't have to focus. There's a whole other person that you don't have to think about and schedule around and manage and feed. The feeding thing was a big change for us. Right. And yes, the groceries changed. Our meal times changed. The feedings. Um, <laughs> yes, the feedings. <laughs> yeah. You start with feedings and end with feedings. It was, it was a big adjustment. And I think some of it happens gradually because as they get older yes. and they get jobs and they gain more independence and they're driving and doing things that – things do change gradually. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of ease into it. But there is that day when they get on that plane or or drive Mm -hmm. out of the driveway. Mm -hmm. And it's very severe. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of disorienting for me to come home and just not know, what do I have to do? There was a bunch of things I didn't have to do anymore. Wow. It's an ending. It is. And it's a beginning, yeah. as every ending is. I'm glad you mentioned, like, there is this souring thing that happens, though, with children. And <laughs> as they get older, I don't know if it happened with Lindsay and Megan, but 
certainly happened with our sons is they got older in high school and they're mm-hmm. gone more. It's, I think it's a gift from God, actually, that they're getting mm-hmm. ready to leave. And mm-hmm. in order for them to leave, there's got to be a little bit of, yeah, I got to get out of here feeling. <laughs> I was really ready for Lindsay to leave there when she go. went away mm-hmm. because she was ready. She was so, you know, she was at that age where... You know, independence is important and it's a place where you want your children to be going and doing. And yet there is a it's a double edged sword in the sense that it's painful and it's a bittersweet time. And you want them to be independent and they want to be independent, but it's messy, you know, and it's it gets messy on both sides. And you had said earlier about just the changes that happen. And I there's so many different rippling effects when your children leave yes, or when, you know, your family changes. And for us, one of the rippling effects was that you talked about the activity, Lisa, and we had so much activity in our home. Two girls, every day there were 10 girls in our Mm -hmm. home after school and, and boys and life and, you know, cooking in the kitchen and, you know, which drove me nuts, you Mm -hmm. know, that's the double edged piece. Yeah. You're ready for them to go. (laughs) But I didn't realize how hard that void was going to be for me, just even not having my daughter's friends there yes. who had grown up in my home that I loved as daughters and sons. And so it's you have that maternal heart for your children's friends. And, you know, I, I didn't realize how much I would miss them. Right. I miss my daughters dearly, but I miss their their friends and just hearing about their lives yes. and the places they are moving into and the boys and the drama and you know there's a part of me that really misses that and just the life in the home of course of course so some of you are going to be um who are listening are are past it some of you are entering into it and I don't think it gets talked about enough, actually, or honored for the sorrow and the massive shift in your life that it is, because it is. When John and I took our first son to school, Samuel, when we were at the place to say goodbye, I did not have any idea of the amount of excruciating pain that I was going to feel, that John and I were going to feel. When we said our goodbye, we got in our car, we drove away as far as we could, which was about a block. Mm -hmm before we pulled over and sobbed our guts out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we learned later from Sam and talking to his brothers that he said the most painful thing for him was seeing how much it hurt us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we kind of learned, you know, with the next one to temper it and and just bless his going. Yes, it hurt. He knew that, but he wasn't going to feel the full weight of our sorrow. And then I learned a little bit more with Luke. One thing I was really clear about with Luke, because been through it three times was the grief was still there, the sorrow. I love having my boys home. I love, love, love being a mom. And yes, they were normal boys that would drive me crazy sometimes as well as I them. But I realized with Luke in particular, and it applied to all of them, that for my relationship to continue with my sons, for it to grow and mature as I want it to, he had to leave. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I began to see, even after only a few months, the return of Mm -hmm. him emotionally and sharing and and in his heart. Just, okay, this has to happen, but I hate it. Mm -hmm. Who thought of this idea anyway? You know, this whole leaving home or who thought they could grow up and move Mm -hmm. out. And yes, I want that. And thank you, God, that they're healthy and they're able to. And just the whole gamut of emotions But I think for me, the loss, I was not prepared for the devastation that I felt. I had to weep a lot Mm -hmm. and with John and grieve and and forgive my sons for leaving. Like, what? You don't like me anymore? And just all of it. And then feeling abandoned by them. I just poured my life into you guys for like 25 years and you think you get to go off and have your own. They don't live anywhere near me now. They say they want to move back to this area, but just a gamut of emotions. And so it's, they're all true. Just, you get to feel them. You get to honor what you're feeling, whether it's yay, thank goodness, I only have one (laughs) load of laundry now, 
or you wouldn't believe how many glasses are not all over my counter、mm-hmm. anymore, or it's falling on their bed and sobbing, and then asking God, "Who am I now?、Mm-hmm. What is my life about? What's my core identity still? I kind of I was mom,、mm-hmm. and I'm still mom, but."、Um, I have、It's、a、different. lot of hours in my day now. Yeah, I think as you're realizing your children are growing up, one of the things that was somewhat of a revelation to me when our girls left for their lives and we left for ours was that God was growing me up in ways that I never realized I needed as well. Tell、you、us、know? about that. That's that's、the、so maturing, good. Maturing,、um, you know, as I'm grieving them and that part of. Me that wants to hold on to that season in my life, and in some levels, just rebelling against more.、Uh-huh. Feel like I'm satisfied, and and I love this, and I love this place that I have been able to rule.、Uh-huh. <laughs> But just that that part of drawing unto the Lord in ways that has matured me, and that He has used that to.、Um, We are image bearers, yes, but we are not God. And there's that part of me that just so wants to be God, wants to be God in their lives and control and rule it. And and some of that is from just such a wonderful heart, and other parts it's just from a needy heart. And so God exposing those places in my heart that are still needy and need to be healed, and that I need to come to Him for, not my children, not my friendships even, or my husband, but. Just some real lonely places. I mean, because it's a lonely time in a lot of ways, and so God has used that loneliness to reveal to me areas that He wants to grow me up in. And now we have struck gold, ladies and gentlemen. Because <laughs> yes, yes, there are seasons to our lives. This season is painful, and the invitation from God is to Him and to life. We have to let them go. We have to open up our hands, and that doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. But how are you? I know that you both are living this well. So how are you pressing into God to come for you in these places that need Him, that are new? For me, it's inviting Him.、Mm. That term that we love and use, I'm inviting Him into that, even without. Knowing what that might look like, so knowing I don't know what's ahead in this next phase. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's required or not required of me, but I know who does,、oh, and I、yes. know that just because my mothering or my cooking and cleaning part might be over for my children. But there's still more. This is not like the end. Right? They still need their mother. They still need their mother. But there's even more for me. Yes. There's more for me. So this isn't like okay. God says, check. You've done that. You know, go and live the rest of your life and do whatever you want to shop or garden or whatever. I know that there's more. I know there's another season. There's another adventure. There's more. And. That kind of excites me to know that it's not the end. That I don't have to drop a ball or throw in the towel or quit on any level. But there's more. Okay, just hone in on that sentence because that is so true. I remember、um, being in the woods. It was autumn, glorious aspen gold surrounding me, and I was lingering on a fallen log, and it was so beautiful. <laughs> And I felt God saying, "Okay, it's time to move on. It's time to leave、mm-hmm. this place. Let's go on down the path now." And I didn't want to leave because it was so beautiful and I loved it. And、um, He said, "You you can't see what's coming, but good is coming, and you can't have it unless you keep walking with Me."、Yes. So we can't see what's around the path, but in Christ, because we are His and daughters of the King, we can hold on to the truth: there is always good coming. Mm-hmm. There is more、mm-hmm. good coming,、mm-hmm. always, and not only for us, but for our kids. Yes. So if they're parked on our couch, they're not going to launch and do the things that God has for them to do. And my parents let me leave, but they let me leave begrudgingly or、mm. with a little guilt attached. So I always felt badly about 
the things that I wanted to do. Mm. You know, I spent some time overseas and traveling and missions and that kind of thing. But I knew I carried with that guilt. And that was really a torn feeling in my heart. And I I don't want to offer that to my kids. I want them to launch and to have freedom and adventure and fun and walk through the trials that they need to walk through with their God, not with me, Mm -hmm. figuring it out for them. And Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, maybe that's not the best place to launch out of, but I didn't want them to have baggage from me when they left. It's so important. It's so important. We can't Mm -hmm. be clinging to their legs saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. Right. We can't. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, no. (laughs) Women do. Mothers do. I've had my moments. But you're right. What that leaves them with then. Yes. The guilt. Yes. Yes. In that place of um, they s- is what they still want from us, whatever stage, is to see a strength, an anchoring that we have that is apart from them. Yes. You know, after we had moved away and our girls had gone on, and every time I saw them and I would get on the plane to come home and I would say goodbye to them at the airport and I would just fall apart. I could not hold myself together and I just started weeping and And this went on for a while, you know, probably (laughs) way too long. (laughs) 30 years. (laughs) I I got on the plane, and it was one of those moments where it was so clear to me God was speaking to me. And he said, okay, Lori, that's enough. You've done your last crying in front of your children when you leave. And that I want when you leave, you know, say goodbye to them at the airport. I want them to see your strength. And your joy and your your just not this sorrow, not this heaviness of your heart that just feels like it can't go on then and it's up to them or it's you know, that that's part of them seeing their mother step into something new. It's going down that road, that journey, and is what they need to see is your strength now. And it's been interesting over the years, because we've been empty nesters for quite a while now, that I can look back now and see my girls in their lives and how they have made choices and hard choices as young women. And I see the fruit of yeah. the labor there, the, the choosing to love them well and to listen to God and how to love them. Yes. Oh, that's so beautiful. You're mothering them well in doing that. And then modeling, the listening to God. Oh, wait a minute. You know it's not perfect. There's still that. (laughs) And I thought it was. (laughs) It's still far from perfect. Like, well, at what age do we achieve perfection? We should have a podcast Mm. with our kids. (laughs) (laughs) Tell a different story. No, but that's all. It's so good. I'm, I'm hearing just truth and truth. Blessing their leaving, praying for them, not clinging to them, not sucking our life out of them. Not asking them to tell us that we're okay, but for us to seek that in God, to press into his heart, to invite him into the sorrow and the grief and the question of what's next, and let our children see we have our own walk with God. We have a life that's apart from them. And actually, they needed to know that for a long time. Mm -hmm. But then at that point that we have a strength. And you will get this, too, because they're still watching. They're still taking note. Oh, yeah. And I think this is a really important season for them to take note. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do, too. Yeah. And it's important for them to know that there's someone more important to you than them, and that's your God. Can you just say that one more time? It's important for your kids to see that you are following God, that you've got someone bigger in your life than them. And it's not always an easy choice, but to let them see you making hard choices and following God. And it it's really part of our legacy to our children. You know, gosh, I saw my mom and dad making tough choices and going after God in ways. And yet I see it's a glimpse into God and his heart and what he's inviting them into. You know, I'm following God, and I invite you to do the same, you know. Yes. And if they don't see that in your life, 
that's something that we can give our kids that we don't even see at times. That is so good. That's really the most important gift we can give our children. The most important gift we can give our spouse, our friends, our neighbors is us loving God and loving him first and finding our life there. And the other thing is being happy. Mm -hmm. We're meant to be happy. Mm -hmm. And that relieves the pressure on them to make us happy. Huge. You know, not that we're skipping around every day, you know, I'm so happy in Jesus every Mm -hmm. moment. But he is the source of our joy and our happiness and not them. And when we have that, it gives them such hope and freedom. And then they want to come back. Yes. Yeah. Say that. (laughs) (laughs) So many things going through my head for those that are listening and questions that might be spawning off. But one of the things I want to touch on is going back to what we mean when we say invite Jesus in to it or finding our life in God. Like, like, what does that mean? Like, no, pick really? Me. I pick you, Lisa. Pick Lisa, what does that mean? I love taking something to God that I don't have any idea how this can resolve. I don't know how you are going to come into this, Jesus. I don't know what you have for me. I don't have an answer. I don't have anything I can conjure for myself that would be better than what you would do. So meet me here praying, just saying, God, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what direction I'm supposed to take. Can you show me? It really is a relief to kind of sit back and watch what will unfold and what he might bring. And to me, it's like a whole different source of adventure, you know? It is. And then so what does that look like? Does he come in that moment and say, well, actually, what I want you to do is to lead mission trips to Africa? That's usually how it happens. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. It comes comes in a telegraph. (laughs) Yes. No, it's uh, a shooting star. (laughs) It's usually just kind of an unfolding of situations or meetings with people or inspiration from something. And all of a sudden you realize you're living in an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking of your position right now, but the waiting. It's a posture of bringing to him your question, your heart, your need, your desire, things you can't even put words to, and asking him, for guidance, giving it to him, asking what's next, and then waiting. You're not a woman that prays that and then goes to the help wanted ads and just starts sending out applications. It's like there's a posture of openness and Hmm. waiting and a posture of being attentive. The wait, she said that, oh, wait, I just read this. And and then having the answer look differently than we might anticipate, which makes us look back, go, oh, I'm living it. He's answering that yes. question. I'm, I'm thinking about mm-hmm. your position now at the preschool. Like yes. you're being attentive to that. What's that story? Well, I, I ended up working at this really great little preschool, which is something I never saw myself doing. And yes, <laughs> I'd worked at high schools. I'd done a lot of things, but preschool was not on my list of things to ever pursue. And in working there, I've developed relationships not only with the other staff and with the students, but with the students' parents who are an age group of 20, 30s, and some 40s that I probably wouldn't get to interact with. And we interact on a level that is important and that is um, allows me to offer something that they need. And then in turn, I receive a whole lot from them mm. because they're exploring new things. And it's very interesting and very lovely relationship that I've stepped into at that little preschool. And so it, it doesn't look like much if you just observed it from the outside, but it has become its own little um, community and world that I've really, really enjoyed. Yes. And, was, and a minute opportunity to minister and yes. speak into those younger women's lives in a way that has weight to it. Yes. And that's just one story. So I think what we're coming back around to is it's difficult. It's painful. You need to grieve. It is a substantive Mm -hmm. loss. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you need to be Mm open-handed, invite Jesus in, and allow him to address things in our hearts that 
he needs to get to. And you know how his favorite way really is through pain. Mm -hmm. And when we're suffering and it's revealing places that we maybe were looking for life apart from him, he's got more for us. He always has more for us. And we may not see what it is. It may not be clear in the moment, but, you know, looking back, we'll see it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's such a big word and empty nest. I mean, I think so many women feel shame over how much they grieve, how much they weep and their sorrow, and that there's something wrong with them, that they are so brokenhearted at the moment or mm-hmm. at the, in this season. And, you know, it's not a thing to be shameful over. It's a thing to bring to God. And the other piece is, is that your heart aches so deeply because you've loved deeply. Mm. And we don't just throw things away that we love or let them go easily. You know, Um, our girls have been gone for 15 years now, and I still am grieving the empty nest. And it's looking different, and I am rebounding differently, and I am finding God in ways that are different. But it is, that's going to be a grief. That's going to be a sorrow in my heart until heaven. I will be grieving that because that isn't what heaven is about. That isn't the empty nest, and it is a very full nest, and it's a perfect nest. And I think that as moms, that's one of our fears or or just even what we want for our kids is that perfect nest. Mm -hmm. And we're always still trying to figure out a way to give it to them, Mm -hmm. and it's heaven. And I think for me, you know, the tears, yes, and to be strong and let my kids see my courage, my strength, my you know, stepping into hard things in life. And yet the sorrow is still there too. And it's not that I'm weeping in front of them all the time, but we've got six grandchildren now that we're Mm. not near. And it's, I feel sorrowful over not being a part of my daughter's life. It's they're walking through that on a daily basis or these grandchildren now, you know, and I don't want to have shame for that, that I do love them. But I want to go to God even with that love for my kids and learn what that looks like for me in this season to love them. Mm -hmm. I think where I would love to land is with this truth that we live in, that we are in act three of a four act story and it ends well. Mm. One thing that helps me with saying goodbyes, which I hate all forms of goodbyes, is that a big hello is coming. Mm-hmm. Or when I'm having the sweetest time with my children or friends, and then it's over, I'm getting it back. My sons don't live near me. They're in school. They're off here. They're doing that. But there will be a day mm-hmm. where every good thing, every cherished moment, every connection, every moment of laughter, all beauty, we get it all back. All things will be restored. We are going, not just going to heaven, but we're getting the earth too. And we're getting all kinds of fabulous things. Every good thing. We get everyone that we've said goodbye to early. We get Maddie. Mm -hmm. We get everybody. Mm -hmm. Good is coming. So now in this partial, in this waiting, we get to enjoy what's here. Enjoy it. Not have to demand it because we know the fullness is coming. Now we get a taste And there's more healing, there's more hope, there's more goodness for us now. And ultimately, finally, the best is ours. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us today. We could go on for another two hours, and you know what? Maybe we will. (laughs) (laughs) But right now, wherever you're at, whatever you're feeling, I want to invite you with my sisters here to invite Jesus in whatever your day is facing, whatever season of life, Jesus, come for me today. Thanks for joining us, the Ransom Heart Podcast. Come again.